pages 216 to 235 of Refugee, chapters 37, 38, and 39. Joseph, just outside Havana Harbor, the year 1939, 21 days from home. Joseph watched from the deck as another little boat snuck through the flotilla of reporters and fruit sellers and Cuban policemen surrounding the MS St. Louis. This boat held a familiar looking passenger and Joseph realized with a start that it was Dr. Aber, Renata and Evelyn's father who already lived in Cuba. Joseph ran through the ship until he found the sisters in the movie theater watching serials. Your dad's coming to the ship, Joseph told them. Renata and Evelyn hurried after him. When they got back to the ladder at sea deck, they got an even bigger surprise. Dr. Aber had gotten on board the St. Louis. Officer Padron was looking over some papers Dr. Aber had brought with him, and a small crowd had gathered to see what was happening. Renata and Evelyn ran to their father, and he swept them up in his arms. My beautiful daughters, he said, kissing them both. I thought I'd never see you again. Officer Padron nodded and said something in Spanish to Dr. Aber, and Dr. Aber smiled at his daughters. Come, it's time for you to join me in Cuba. But what about our things, our clothes, Renata asked. Forget about them. We'll buy you new clothes in Cuba, Dr. Aber said. His eyes darted to the policeman, and Joseph understood. Somehow, Dr. Aber had gotten someone official to let him come get his daughters off the ship, but he didn't want to wait around any longer in case the policemen changed their minds. He carried Renata and Evelyn to the ladder, and Renata barely had time to yell goodbye to Joseph and wave before they were gone over the side. Joseph was speechless, but the rest of the crowd wasn't. Angry passengers surrounded Officer Padron and the other policemen demanding answers. How come they got off the ship and not us? Can you help us? How did they do it? Let us off the ship. My husband is in Cuba. They have papers, write papers, Officer Padron tried to explain in broken German. But that only made the crowd matter. We have papers, visas, we paid for them. Joseph was scared for Officer Padron, but he shared the passenger's frustration. Why had Dr. Aber been able to take Renata and Evelyn off and none of the rest of them could go? It wasn't fair. Joseph clenched his fists and began to shake. Then he realized it wasn't him that was doing the shaking. It was the metal deck of the ship. The engines were rumbling to life for the first time since they had dropped anchor, which could mean only one thing. The St. Louis was going home to Germany, and they were all going with it. Without a word from anyone, the passengers rushed the top of the ladder as one. Officer Padron drew his pistol, and Joseph gasped. Button, the policeman cried. Halt! He swept the gun back and forth, and the other policemen drew their pistols and did the same. The angry passengers pulled back but didn't run away. Joseph's heart was in his throat. Any second now, the mob was going to attack the policemen. Joseph knew it. They would rather die than be sent back to Germany, back to Hitler. The first, the ship's first officer and the purser arrived and threw themselves in between the guards and the angry crowd. They begged for everyone to remain calm, but no one listened. And the vibrations of the ship engines blew below grew louder and more insistent. More people rushed to the ladder to demand to be let off the ship. Joseph was caught in the middle now. If the mob pushed forward into the guns of the policemen, Joseph have, would have no choice but to push with them. It was hot, well over 100 degrees on deck already, and the temperature of the crowd was rising. Joseph was a ball of sweat, and the close-packed mob only made things worse. The situation was about to boil over when a small white man in a gray suit climbed up the ladder behind the policeman. It was Captain Schroeder, but Joseph wondered why was he out of uniform, and why had he been off the ship? For a moment, the mob was so surprised it stopped surging forward. Captain Schroeder was surprised, too. As soon as he saw the angry crowd and the guns drawn, he lost his temper. He yelled at the policemen to lower their weapons or he would order them off the ship, and at last they obeyed. Why have the engines started, one of the passengers yelled. Tell us what's happening. Captain Schroeder put his hands in the air and called for calm so that he could explain. He took off his hat and mopped his brow with his handkerchief. I've just been to see President Brew, to appeal to him personally for you to be allowed to disembark, the captain said, but he would not see me. There were dark mutterings am among the passengers, and Joseph felt himself getting angrier. What was going on? Why had the Cubans promised the passengers they would let them in, only to turn them away now? 
Worse, Captain Shorter said, the Cuban government has orders, ordered us to leave the harbor by tomorrow morning. Leave by tomorrow, Joseph thought, and go where? And what about his father? Would he be leaving with them? Cries of anger came from the passengers, and Joseph joined in. The first officer came from the path. The first cries. The first officer had disappeared briefly, but now returned with more sailors in case there was violence. Joseph wondered if he should bring his mother to hear this news, but he knew she was in her cap in their cabin, most likely in bed crying. She blamed herself for her husband's suicide attempt. In the last two days, she had become, in a way, as absent as a parent as Joseph's father. No, Joseph was the one who needed to be here right now for his mother and for Ruthie. Captain Schroeder called for quiet again. We are not going home. We will cruise the American coast and make appeals to President Roosevelt. If any of you have friends or family in states, I beg to you to ask them to exert what influence they can, no matter what. I assure you, I will do everything in my power to arrange a landing outside Germany. Hope must always remain. Now please go back to your cabins. I must return to the bridge to make the ship ready for our departure. The crowd mobbed the captain as he tried to leave sea deck, the passengers pushing and shoving their way around Joseph. Joseph fought his way to the passenger who had translated for Officer Padron the other day and pulled him to where the policeman stood. What about my father? Joseph asked Officer Padron through the translator. I saw him in the hospital, the policeman told Joseph. He's not well enough to come to the ship. Then can we go to him instead? Joseph asked. The policeman looked pained. I'm sorry, little man, you cannot leave the ship. But the ship is leaving, Joseph said. He could feel the pulsing engines under his feet. We can't leave my father behind. I wish from the bottom of my heart that you will land soon, little man, Officer Padron said again. I'm sorry, I'm just doing my job. Joseph looked deep into Officer Padron's eyes, searching for some sign of help, some hint of sympathy. Officer Padron just looked away. Joseph was still standing there in the hot Cuban sun when right before lunch, the policeman left on the launch. Officer Padron still wouldn't look at him. Once the little boat was clear, the MS St. Louis blew its horn, raised its anchor, and left Havana Harbor, destination unknown. As he stood at the rail with the rest of the passengers, saying tearful goodbye to the only place that had ever promised them refuge, Joseph said goodbye to his father as well. He took his shirt collar in both hands and ripped it along the seam, rendering, rending his garment as he'd done when Professor Wheeler had been buried at sea. Joseph knew Papa was still alive, but it didn't matter. His father was dead to his family. And so, Joseph realized, was their dream of joining him in Cuba. Isabel, somewhere between the Bahamas and Florida, the year 1994, five days from home. The night sky was so clear, Isabel could see the Milky Way. Her gaze was on the stars, but she wasn't really looking at them. She wasn't really looking at anything. Her eyes were blurry from tears. Next to her, Senora Castillo sobbed in her husband's arms, her shoulders heaving. Like Isabel, she had been crying ever since Ivan died. Senor Castillo stared out over his wife's head, his eyes vacant. Lewis kicked out at the silent engine, rattling the bolts that held it down. He buried his face in his hands, and Amara hugged him tight. Ivan was dead. Isabel couldn't grasp it. One minute he had been alive, talking to them, laughing with them, and the next he was dead, lifeless, like every other Cuban who had ever died trying to get to El Norte by sea. But Ivan wasn't some nameless, faceless person. He was Ivan, her Ivan. He was her friend, and he was dead. Isabel's eyes drifted down to where Ivan's body lay, but he still didn't look right at him. Couldn't. Even though Poppy had taken down the shirt he draped over Mommy to shade her and laid it across Ivan's face, Isabel couldn't bear to look. She knew Ivan's face, his smile. She wanted to think of him that way. Lido sang a low, sad song, and Isabel retreated into the arms of her mother and father. The three of them huddled together, as if what happened to Ivan might happen to them too if they came too close to his body. But the thrill, real threat was the sinking boat and the sharks that circled it, following the trail of bloody water that started at Isabel's feet. Fidel Castro had Ivan's blood all over him. Isabel remembered the wake of her grandmother. It had been quiet, somber occasion. There hadn't even been a been a body to bury. 
Those who had come had spent most of their time comforting Lido and Mommy and Isabel, hugging them and kissing them and sharing their grief. Isabel now knew she should do that now for the Castillos, but she couldn't bring herself to do it. How could she comfort the Castillos when she still needed comfort- comforting herself? Ivan was their son, their brother, but he was Isabel's best friend. In some ways, she knew him better even than his family did. She played soccer with him in the alley, swam with him in the sea, sat next to him in school. She even, she had even eaten dinner at his house, and he at hers. So many times they might as well have been brother and sister. Isabel and Ivan had grown up together. She couldn't imagine a world where she would run next door and he wouldn't be there. But Ivan wouldn't be coming over anymore. Ivan was dead. The loss of him ate like a part of Isabel was suddenly missing, like her heart had been ripped out of her chest, and all that was left was a giant gaping hole. She shook her she shook again as her body was racked with sobs, and mommy pulled her closer. Mm-hmm. After a time, Isabel's grandfather finally spoke. We need to do something, he said, with the body. Senora Castillo wailed, but Senor Castillo nodded. Do something with the body. Isabel looked around. But what was there to be done with Ivan's body on this little raft? And then Isabel understood. There was only one place for Ivan's body to go. Into the sea. The thought made her recoil in terror. No, no, we can't leave him there, Isabel cried. We'll be all alone. Ivan never liked to be alone. Lido nodded to Isabel's father, and the two of them stood to lift Ivan out of the small boat. Isabel fought to get free of her mother, but Mommy held her tight. Wait, Senora Casillo said. She pulled herself away from her husband, her face streaked with tears. We have to say something, a prayer, something I want God to know Ivan is com- coming. Isabel had never been to church. When Castro and the communists had taken over, they had discouraged the practice of religion. But Spanish Catholics had conquered the island long before Castro had, and Isabel knew their religion was still there deep down, the way Lito told her clave was buried beneath the audible rhythms of a song. Lito was the oldest and had been the most funeral, so he took charge. He made the sign of the cross over Ivan's body and said, Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen. Senora Castillo nodded, and Lito and Isabel's father picked up Ivan's body. No, Isabel cried. She reached out as if to stop them, then pulled her hands back and clasped them to her chest. She knew they had to do this, that they could not keep Ivan on the boat with them. Not like this, but as she watched Lito and Poppy lift up Ivan's body, the empty place inside got bigger and bigger until she was more empty than full. She wished she was dead, too. She wished she was so dead that... so they would put her into the water with Ivan, so she could keep him company in the deep. Senora Castillo reached out and took her son's hand one last time, and Louis stood and put a hand to Ivan's chest, one last connection to his brother before he was gone for good. Isabel wanted to do something, to say something, but she was too overcome with grief. Wait, Louis said. He pulled his pistol from his holster. His face turned mean, and he aimed it over the other side of the boat at one of the fins that skimmed the surface. Isabel was ready for the shots this time, but they still made her jump. Bang, bang, bang. The shark died in a bloody thrashing spasm, and the other sharks that had been following the boat fell on it in a frenzy. Louis nodded to Lido and Isabel's father, and Senora Castillo looked away as they they slipped Ivan off the other side of the boat, away from the sharks, where he sank into the Black Sea. No one spoke. Isabel cried, the tears coming without end flowing up from the hollow place in her chest that threatened to consume her. Ivan was gone forever. Isabel suddenly remembered Ivan's industrialist cap. Where was it? What had happened to it? It hadn't been on him when he'd been put back in the water, and Isabel wanted to find it, needed to find it. There was something she could do, a piece of him. She could keep close to her. She pulled away from her mother and searched a little boat for it. It had to be somewhere. Yes, there floating upside down in the bloody water underneath one of the benches. She plucked it up and held it to her chest, the only part of Ivan she had left. I wanted to open a restaurant, Senor Casillo said. He was right next to her, and the sound of his voice, almost a whisper, whisper, made Isabel jump. When we were talking that first night, everybody was telling each other what they wanted to do when they got to the U.S., Senor Casillo went on, but I never said. I wanted to open a restaurant with my sons. 
Something sparkled on the dark horizon, and at first Isabel took it to be one of the stars in the white, in the white scar of the Milky Way twinkling in her watering eyes, but no, it was too bright, too orange, and there were others just like it all clustered in a horizontal line, separating the black waters from the black sky. It was Miami, at last. Ivan had just missed seeing Miami. Mahmoud, Macedonia to Serbia, the year 2015, 14 to 15 days from home. Mahmoud felt like he was back in Syria. Policemen with guns guarded the border from Greece into Macedonia, and he felt dirty again, unwanted, illegal. Even without travel papers, Mahmoud and his family had been able to exchange their Syrian pounds for euros and buy train tickets from Athens to Thessaloniki and from there to a little Greek town near the border of Macedonia. Now they were headed for the Macedonian town of Gevglahia, where they hoped to catch a train north to Serbia and from there to Hungary. But first they had to find a way to sneak across the border. Mahmoud pointed out a little tangle of tents and laundry lines just off the gravel road, and Mahmoud's father pulled them into the camp to plan their next move. It was another little refugee village, the kind of makeshift town Mahmoud had seen again and again on the road out of Syria. Mahmoud and his father hunkered down behind a trash barrel and watched the border crossing. The Macedonian police weren't turning people away, but they might be checking papers, and Mahmoud's family hadn't waited in Athens for official travel permits. Mahmoud's dad pulled out his iPhone and consulted the map. This whole area is farmland, his father said. Flatland. Too easy to be caught. He scrolled sideways on the map, and Mahmoud leaned in closer. It looks like there's a forest here to the west, dad said. They can't have every meter of the border guarded. We'll slip through at night. Once we're in Macedonia, we'll be all right. Where's your mother? Mahmoud looked up. Mom was, was where she always was, working her way through the tents, looking for Hannah. Hannah wasn't there, though, and she wasn't at any of the other little clusters of refugee tents they passed as they hiked farther into the countryside. At some place he'd picked from the map on his iPhone, Mahmoud's father led them off a dirt road into a dark forest. It was late, well after midnight, and Mahmoud was weary from walking, but they still had two hours to walk to the Macedonian border. Walid raised his arms to be carried, and Dad hefted him up against his shoulder. Mahmoud bristled. Walid was being a baby. He was too big to be carried. Mahmoud was tired too, but nobody was carrying him. They walked along in silence, their way lit only by the occasional glow of the phone screen as Dad checked their position. The forest was full of tall pine trees that crowded almost everything else out, and the ground was covered with brown pine needles that smelled like car freshener. Somewhere in the forest, an owl screeched, and Mahmoud heard the scurrying of small animals. Every rustle made Mahmoud jump. Every scuffle gave him goosebumps. He was a city boy, used to the lights and sounds of traffic. Here, every sound was like a gunshot in the unearthly, dark, and quiet. It terrified Mahmoud. At last, they emerged from the dark woods and found the train station. It was a small, two-story, mustard-colored building with a burgundy roof and rounded gables. It was also packed with people. Hundreds of people slept outside, using their backpacks and trash bags as pillows. They filled the train platform and the sidewalks in front of the station, and some even slept between the tracks. Plastic bottles and empty bags and discarded wrappers littered the ground. Mahmoud watched his father's shoulders sag. Mahmoud felt the same way. But then his father stood taller and hiked while he'd up higher on his shoulder. Hey, at least we know we're on the right track, he said. He grinned at Mahmoud. The right track. Get it? Mahmoud got it. He just didn't think any of this was funny. No, nothing, his father said. I guess I need to train you better. Mahmoud still didn't laugh. He was too tired. Mahmoud's mother had already left them, stepping carefully among the sleeping refugees like a ghost, searching for Hannah. The train station looks closed, Mahmoud's father told him. We'll have to find some place else to sleep. We'll come back in the morning and see if we can buy tickets. They found a nearby hotel listed on TripAdvisor, and they collected Mahmoud's mother and set out for the inn on foot. Mahmoud couldn't wait to climb into a real bed. He felt like he could sleep for days. A car came up behind them, and this time Mahmoud didn't jump out in front of it, but it slowed down and stopped beside them anyway. 
You need a taxi, the man said in broken Arabic. No, Mahmoud's father said. We're just going to the hotel. Hotel much money, the man said. You go to Serbia, I take you in taxi, 25 euros each. Mahmoud did the math. 100 euros was a lot of money, almost 24,000 Syrian pounds. But a taxi ride straight to Serbia without spending the night or longer in Macedonia. Mahmoud's parents huddled together and Mahmoud listened in. Train tickets were likely cheaper. And mom worried about accepting a ride from a strange man in a country they didn't know. But dad argued there wasn't another train until at least tomorrow. And there were already so many people waiting for the train at the station. We're all tired and a taxi gets us closer to Germany. Sleeping on the ground doesn't. Mahmoud threw in. That's the deciding vote then, dad said. We'll take the car. It was a good decision. Two hours and 100 euros later, they were at the Serbian border. It was still dark, but there were no border guards where the driver dropped them off. No roads either. Mahmoud had slept a little in the car, but he felt like a zombie as he shambled with his family along the railroad tracks that would take them across the border from Macedonia to the nearest Serbian town. Since they were traveling, they were permitted to skip their early morning prayers. They staggered into a town just after sunup. Mahmoud thought if he didn't lie down somewhere and sleep, he would pass out on his feet and fall flat on his face. But there were even more refugees at this station than there had been in Macedonia. And here there were no tents and no hotel rooms. People slept on the platform of the station or outside in the fields. There were no toilets either and no markets or restaurants. What little the local Serbs had, they were charging a fortune for. One man was selling water bottles for five euros a piece. A group of men sat around a power strip charging their phones as they were huddled around a campfire. Mahmoud had seen scenes like this everywhere along the route from Athens to Germany. He and his family paused just long enough to recharge their own phones again, and then they were on the move once more. Mahmoud was so tired he wanted to cry. His father found them a bus to Belgrade, and Mahmoud was thankful for the few hours of sleep, uncomfortable though they were. It was almost sundown when they arrived in the Serbian capital, but they still couldn't stop. The police there were raiding hotels for illegal refugees, so Dad found another taxi driver who promised to take them two hours further to the Hungarian border. Taxis were expensive, but so was trying to stay overnight in a city that didn't want you. The silver four-door Volkswagen was driven by a middle-aged, olive-skinned Serbian man with a neatly trimmed black beard. He promised to get them to Hungary and keep them away from the police for 30 euros apiece, more than it cost them to cross all of Macedonia. It was a tight fit in the car with Mahmoud, his mother, and his father crammed into the back seat and Walid in his father's lap. The new driver seemed to find every rut or hole in the road and send them flying into each other, but none of that mattered to Mahmoud. He was asleep as almost as soon as he'd closed his eyes, and he only woke again when he realized the car wasn't moving. Had it really been two hours already? He felt like he'd just gone to sleep. Mahmoud's eyelids fluttered and he looked out the windows, expecting to see the lights of Serbian border town, another tent city. Instead, they were stopped in the middle of a lonely stretch of highway surrounded by dark, empty fields. And the taxi driver was leaning over the back seat with a pistol aimed straight at them.